As we closed that litany a moment ago, our graduates prayed the prayer, God, let your light shine through us in the years ahead. As we think seriously about discipleship today, I think what we ponder, what Jesus is calling us to, is an answer to that prayer for all of us. God's light shining through us. Notice how this passage of Scripture begins. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus when He turned to them and said, and what follows that phrase is a statement of comparison, a couple of analogies, and two parables that are meant to help us think seriously about discipleship. So that's what I want us to do for the next several minutes. I want us to think seriously about discipleship, not just as a concept, but I'd like for you to think seriously about your own discipleship, about your own commitment to Jesus. Jesus says, if anyone comes after me, if anyone wants to follow me and wait just there for a minute, aren't they already coming after him? Aren't they already following him? No, and this is a significant point that we shouldn't miss here. Just because you're traveling in a large crowd with Jesus does not mean you're one of His disciples. There is a difference between being a disciple of Jesus and being in a crowd that is traveling with Jesus. You can be in a crowd that is interested in Jesus, that admires Jesus a great deal, that even seems in appearance to be following Jesus and not be one of his disciples. And since we have a crowd gathered here this morning to listen to what Jesus says about discipleship, I thought it best we start by acknowledging that first. Secondly, before we explore what Jesus says here about the cost and considerations of discipleship, I probably ought to say a little bit about what discipleship is. So, the word disciple appears 269 times in the New Testament. The word Christian appears three times in the New Testament and is used as a way of introducing the disciples of Jesus in a way other than calling them a Jewish religious sect. So the idea that we can be Christian and not be a disciple is not a New Testament idea, though it may be a modern one. Many of us seem to believe that it's quite okay to participate in the crowd of Christianity where we admire Jesus, where we explore our interests in Jesus, and where we even gather weekly to worship Jesus while we continue to withhold our lives from Him. Or to say it another way, many Christians today continue to believe that discipleship is optional. It's not. This is what Dallas Willard has called the great omission. Willard says a disciple is a learner, an apprentice, a student, a practitioner of the ways of Jesus who over time through the power of the Spirit will be transformed inwardly and they'll experience an inner transformation of thought, feeling, and character. Disciples of Jesus are people who don't just profess certain views about Jesus, The disciples of Jesus are people who apply their growing understanding of the kingdom of God to each and every area of their existence. Jesus told us explicitly what to do, Dallas Willard says. He told us that as disciples, that we're supposed to make disciples. The Great Commission of Matthew chapter 28 says that as we go into the world, we should make disciples of all peoples, of every ethnicity, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that Jesus has commanded. But Willard says, in place of Christ's plan, most of us have substituted making disciples with making converts. And we baptize them into church membership instead of into the name of Jesus. And these represent two great omissions from the Great Commission that have resulted in a great disparity between cultural Christians who have converted to the whims and ways of a particular Christian crowd and the all-in disciples of Jesus. Which is not to say that a disciple of Jesus has to be perfect. 
Discipleship is not about perfection or about earning the gift of God's abundant life. No, discipleship is about embracing a way of fully enter in, entering into the life that Jesus said he desperately came to give us. And so with that in mind, Jesus turns to the crowds who are traveling with him and says something we'd never expect anyone who's trying to start a movement to say. Now, it's not, it's not difficult these days for any of us to imagine our public leaders saying anything, right? I mean, let's be honest, it's not difficult for us to imagine people in leadership saying anything these days. But can you imagine, especially a, a politician in modern America, standing up in front of a crowd and saying something like this? If you vote for me, you're voting to lose your homes and your families. You're asking for higher taxes and lower wages. And you will likely have to give up all of your property and everyone you love most in the world. Who's coming with me? Right? <laughs> People would probably be more puzzled if they heard that than they would be upset. I mean, why would anyone on earth who's trying to promote themselves and what they're trying to do to get you to follow their Twitter account or their Instagram account, why would they speak like this to the crowds? And yet this is exactly what Jesus did. If anyone wants to be my disciple, you're going to need to, what does he say? Hate your family, give up everything you own, and be prepared to die a really nasty death. Now, if Jesus' attempt is to build on his growing popularity, if his intent is to achieve some kind of great political power, I think we all know that he desperately needs a new campaign manager. Because this is not the way to do it. But what if that's not what he's interested in? And what if, instead of imagining Jesus here as a great politician, we might imagine him as the leader of a great expedition, forging a way through a high and dangerous mountain pass to bring urgent medical aid to villagers who've been cut off from the rest of the world? He might say something like this. If any of you want to come any further, you'll have to leave your packs behind. Because from here forward, the path is too steep to carry all of that stuff, and once you let it go, you'll probably never see it again. And before we leave, you probably ought to go ahead and write a farewell note to anyone that you love, because this is a dangerous route that we're embarking on, and it's very likely that some of us won't make it back alive. Now, we may not like the sound of that either, but I do think the sound of it makes a lot more sense. And this is the sense of what Jesus is trying to do here. Jesus knows where they're going, right? He knows where he's going. And Jesus wants them and us to follow them. Jesus knows if they follow him, if we'll follow him, he's going to lead us to a place that is better, a higher place, a truer place, a more life-giving place. But he also knows that the path forward is not going to be an easy one. It's going to cost them something. Interest in Jesus isn't going to be enough to get them there. We know where Jesus is going. We know where he wants to take them and us. Interest in Jesus is not going to be enough to get us there. Admiration of Jesus isn't going to be enough to get us there. No, this summit is going to require dedication. The great mountain of discipleship is like that. It's a good path, but it's not an easy one. And so it seems these here have reached the point on the path where they need to know what lies ahead is going to require a good bit more from them than where they've been before. That's probably true for all of us. If anyone comes after me, Jesus says, and does not, now this is a really good campaign slogan too, if you decide to run for council again, maybe try this one. If anyone comes after me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. It's probably going to, I don't know how that's going to poll, but. 
It has to be one of the hardest statements of Jesus to his disciples, right? And how on earth could it even be true or necessary? I mean, put aside the difficulty of hating those we instinctively love the most, how is it that people who've been commanded to love their enemies and pray for those who persecute them are supposed to hate their own families? Most of us have assumed in light of this that we should take these words lightly. That it's a bit of an exaggeration and and because of that, I think a lot of us have simply dismissed these words outright. And if you've done that, I want to say to you that you're both on to something and you're also probably missing something significant as well. To hate is a Semitic expression meaning to turn away from or detach oneself. So when Jesus says we should hate our father and mother, brothers and sisters, he doesn't mean the same thing that we often mean when we say or, or text or tweet, I hate you. That's not what he's saying here. So if you dismiss that idea that Jesus was calling you to hate people that you loved, you were onto something. But if you dismiss the teaching outright, you're also missing something. Because this has a very important, true implication for discipleship. It's not about hatred. It's about attachment. In a sense, Jesus is doing something similar here that is not quite the same as the core teachings of Buddhism. Enlightenment Buddhism comes from understanding and living in response to four noble truths. You may know these. I'm going to simplify them. To live is to suffer. Suffering is caused by our attachments to things like expectations, how we believe things should go. Um, people we love, property, things that we possess, so on and so forth. Number three, we can overcome our attachments to these things. And number four, the holy eightfold path is the way to overcome attachments and suffering. Now this is a generalization, but the point is that Jesus is trying to say something similar here about our attachments. But it's not quite the same. Because in the eightfold path of Buddhism, you're moving toward complete detachment, but in Christianity, you're supposed to eliminate all of your deep attachments except one. Your attachment and your allegiance to Jesus. Nothing in our life is supposed to compete with our ultimate allegiance and attachment to Jesus as the Lord of our lives. Absolutely nothing. And this is what St. Francis of Assisi was trying to embody when he stood in front, of, in front of his wealthy dad with all of the clothes that he had given him in the middle of Assisi and stripped himself naked. He was trying to say, all of this I give up in light of my allegiance and my attachment to Jesus. Disciples of Jesus are supposed to be prepared to renounce everything but Jesus. Nothing is supposed to compete with our allegiance and attachment to Him. Not property, not dreams, not safety, not resources, not political party, and not even our country. And this is the exact point of Jesus' next statement. When we read here that those not willing to carry their cross cannot be disciples of Jesus, we often think this has something to do with personal sacrifice, and it does, a very specific kind. Remember, the cross is not a metaphor here. We say things like, well, I've got to watch my in-law's dog this week. That's just the cross I've got to bear. Or... Christy's going to be mad at me if I don't clean the bathrooms today by the end of the day, so I guess I'll clean the bathrooms. That's just the cross I've got to bear. Right? We say things like that. But that's not what Jesus was saying here. When Jesus talked about cross-bearing, he was talking about a very specific instrument of Roman torture that was inflicted upon people for what? For defying the laws of the state or defying your allegiance to the state. 
So that when early Christians said something like, Jesus is Lord, they were, guess what, making a political statement, sometimes from the baptistry in church. To say that Jesus is Lord was to say that Caesar is not Lord, and many of them were killed for this very reason. Renounce Jesus and pledge your allegiance to Rome or the gods of Rome. Renounce allegiance to Jesus or renounce your allegiance to country. That's your choice. Which will it be? This was the implication for the early Christians who were called to say Jesus is Lord. And often while this was happening, there were people there, family members, loved ones that they were really attached to and they were attached to them begging them to renounce their faith and recant their faith in Jesus. What would be more important in these moments? We celebrate the martyrs, right? People like to celebrate the martyr as heroes. What, what would be more important in this moment? Their attachment and their allegiance to family and nation or their attachment and allegiance to Jesus? We should ask ourselves the same questions, I think. Where does your allegiance lie? What is most important to you in this life, above and beyond everything else? To help us think more about this, Jesus offers these two parables and then asks the question, who among you would build a tower and not consider what it costs to complete it? Or, what king would ever send their country to war without first considering the whole cost? And the answer to that is supposed to be implied and understood, right? No one. Jesus, the answer would be no one. Except we know that's not exactly true. We know that world leaders often send good people into conflict without fully estimating or assessing the lives and resources that will be damaged or lost because of that decision. Just as we know that our world is littered with unfinished projects like the famous one that we've seen in South Dakota. Crazy Horse, right? Still unfinished? Yes. Or that half bathroom in your basement that you thought you were going to finish 10 years ago, but I mean, this thing came and that thing came and it was more expensive than you thought it was going to be. And this is what Jesus is getting about at here. There is no way to completely count the full cost of discipleship. It is a project that will require more renovation than any of us could ever actually anticipate or imagine in the beginning. Though we can prepare by setting aside everything else, or as the writer of Hebrews says, by setting aside and throwing off all of the sins that so easily entangle us and fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, that's what we're being called to do when we're being called to follow Jesus. It's a long arduous and expensive project. And Jesus tells us and shows us this with his own life. Discipleship is costly. So why would anyone ever do it? Why would anyone ever do it? Jesus believes we all should. Partly, I think, because Jesus believes the cost of non-discipleship as we talked about earlier, is even greater. You can pray about that and talk with Jesus about, later, that, about that later, but for now we might consider this. At some point in your life, many of you, probably most of the people in this room, decided to follow Jesus. At some point, you decided, you said publicly, you were going to give yourself to him in the project of discipleship. And there is no question that that project is unfinished. The only question really is, has it stopped? Or is your discipleship still a work in progress? If it is, it should be. 
If it's not, it can be. No matter who you are, or where you are, or how long it's been since you've actually invested in the work of your discipleship, you can always start again. You can always start anew. You can always start fresh, even now. May this hymn of response, as we sing it, be a symbol of our commitment to renew our dedication to Jesus and the long, arduous project of discipleship to Him. We worship together.